So <clears throat> subdural hematomas in general, what are the causes? Trauma, trauma, trauma. Um, this is the main cause of subdural hematoma. It's almost always going to be trauma. Uh, this is a nice, big, beautiful hill in San Francisco that guarantees that I have job security as long as I live here uh, because people do stupid things down this hill like bike or skateboard or ride those like lime scooters that you see everywhere. Uh, anytime I see some people riding those around without a helmet, I thank them for keeping me employed uh, because these are the things that, that come in and give us subdural hematoma. So great hills in San Francisco. You should come visit it sometime. Uh, now that travel restrictions are being lifted. But uh, subdural hematomas, when we're talking about subdurals, we're talking about traumatic brain injuries, we're talking about TBI. <clears throat> there are some other things that sometimes can, can come in and you do want to have these on your radar. An aneurysm on the surface can cause a subdural hematoma. A CSF leak can do that. Um, this, so there are other things that cause subdurals, but 99 plus percent of the time is going to be trauma. Uh, question, what is it? It is very difficult to control the edema intraoperatively. <clears throat> yeah, that's where it gets tough. So you can ask anesthesia to give more mannitol or 23% saline. You can ask anesthesia to hyperventilate the patient, ask them to lift the head of bed up so that the head is above the heart. Um, you can, uh, if it's still uncontrollable there, and this has happened, uh, you do what's closed, called the whip stitch closure, uh, where you simply put your hand on the brain, you keep it from herniating out at you, you've slap the skin flap back on you take the biggest uh, nylon suture they have and you whip the stitch the skin closed as fast as you can uh, to get them off the table usually if you can't control it and that starts happening uh, that is almost 100 percent mortality at that point uh, so unfortunately it's very very bad when that happens but we've had that happen uh, a number of times so yeah it's bad um, so if we're talking about subdural hematomas we need to talk about uh, uh, TBI in general. So TBI, uh, very common. I'm actually going to give uh, another stat uh, a little bit for a paper that literally just got published today or yesterday. Uh, but it's leading, leading cause of death in men under 35, uh, and it is a heavy burden in the U.S. from traumatic brain injury. Uh, as you can see, there's more than just subdural hematomas when we talk about traumatic brain injury. And so I just want to touch on these. I know these aren't the subject of today's talk, but <clears throat> you know, when we're dealing with subdural hematomas, we almost always deal with these other etiologies as well. So uh, traumatic brain injury is a very heterogeneous disease. It's not just subdural hematomas. It's a bunch of other things. Uh, do I worry about contralateral hematoma after craniectomy and what's your protocol for CT after surgery? Always worry about contralateral hematoma. And that's a great thing to think about. Um, protocol for CT after surgery depends on uh, the patient. So if there is somebody had a case like this just, just the other day, somebody came in with a very large contusion that blossomed. And so he's getting a mass effect from the contusion, but he had a subdural hematoma on the other side. Um, so we were very worried that once we took the, the uh, bone off from the subdural that that, or from the contusion, excuse me, that the subdural would expand because we've release the top of not. So in that case, it's immediately once we're done with surgery, we go to the CT scanner all the way up to the ICU. Anesthesia gave us all this pushback. We said, nope, absolutely not. We're not going to the ICU without a CT scan. So we went up, we went straight to the CT. <clears throat> surgery goes great. Um, if I think that, you know, if I'm not worried about another side hematoma, if the surgery goes fantastic uh, and it was just a clear subdural, um, you know, with no real complications, uh, even more so if the patient, if they can get the uh, patient extubated, or if I get a good pupillary or neuro exam after the case, uh, then we'll go up and we'll get a CT scan in four to six hours. So it really depends. It's a case by case. There are no standard protocols for a lot of this. You have to be able to think on your feet and use some common sense. Um, <clears throat> so in traumatic brain injury, when we're dealing with a the subdural, there's a number of questions we have to answer, right? So things like, are they going to, go to the, oops, sorry about that. Are they going to go to the ICU? Are they going to require anti-epileptic anti drugs? Are you going to have to reverse an anticoagulant or antiplatelet drugs? Are you going to put in invasive neuromonitoring and are they going to need surgery? So we already talked about the indications for surgery. That one's pretty straightforward. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about these other, other questions. So <clears throat> ICU admissions, do all subdurals need to go to the ICU? Well, no, there's some good data out there showing that, that a lot of these patients are not at a significant risk to uh, decline. And you'll start seeing this when you're on your neurosurgery rotations, you'll get called about every little tiny blip of blood that's in the head. And some of these little tiny blips of blood, a lot of these little tiny blips of blood are not going to do anything. They're not going to explode and they're not going to ever cause any sort of problems for the patient. So this, uh, this article here, what they did is they made what's called the big protocol, um, <clears throat> where they divided patients into these three categories, one, two, and three. And you can read the, uh, the, um, 
criteria to fit in each one here, but you know, for a subdural, if it's less than four uh, millimeters and, and they have all these other <clears throat> inclusions, then they're what they call the big one. Uh, and they would uh, not admit the BIG ones and twos to the ICU. They would just get a repeat head CT uh, and not admit them to the ICU. And in all, in all honesty, almost all of them did fine. I think there was one patient that declined, but they had some other injuries. So really a lot of these do not uh, end up going to the, need to end up going to the ICU. You just get a repeat head CT and go from there. So I encourage you to read this paper just to get an idea of the sort of things that would make you on high alert. Anyone that has these criteria for the big three, they go to the ICU and they're going to need a repeat head CT. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, this paper, there is a little bit of issue that I personally have with it. And that is that they also advocate for not even calling neurosurgery for patients with the big one and big two. And I think that's a little bit troublesome because of this. And this is what I mentioned, the stat that was literally just published uh, the other day is that 47% uh, of individuals over 40 years old in the US with a history of head injury have a disability. 11.4 million people in the United States have some sort of disability from a head injury. That's a lot of people. And <clears throat> these patients need post-acute care support. They need, um, they need help getting back to work. They need help uh, to make sure that they don't develop drug and alcohol addiction, which uh, tends to pop up in uh, TBI patients. They need help um, to make sure that they are dealing with their post-concussive symptoms okay. And if you're not calling neurosurgery, you need to make sure that somebody in the medical center is taking care of these patients, be it neurology, be it trauma surgery, uh, but neurosurgery, we're the specialty that's tend, uh, tended to deal with um, traumatic brain injury the most. So I think we're probably the most set to take care of these problems, even if they're not surgical. Um, so this is just a personal bias. So I really think that uh, if you're going to take this criteria and not even call neurosurgery for most of the head trauma comes in, I think we're doing a little bit of a disservice to the patients unless you have those uh, post-acute services really set up for them. So there's my own little personal soapbox of bias, but... <clears throat> um, uh, there's it, it's it's a huge disease burden. Um, Anti-epileptic anti -epileptic drugs. This is the classic study. Know this study. This is one of the you know the, the big papers in neurosurgery uh, where they randomized people into phenytoin or placebo after traumatic brain injury <clears throat> and showed that um, uh, on early post-traumatic epilepsy, phenytoin was significantly better than a placebo in preventing seizures. So. Everybody with a subdural, a contusion, and epidural gets uh, seven days of phenytoin in our institution. I know there's some data with Kepro. The data is just not as good, we don't think. So we like using phenytoin, seven days. It's a relatively harmless drug. It's a, drug. It's a cheap drug. It's an easy to monitor drug. Uh, so we do that for seven days, but it does not prevent <clears throat> late seizures. So uh, seven days of phenytoin to prevent early seizures and then stop. Uh, and that's the study for it. Are you going to reverse antiplatelet anticoagulant agents? This is a big question because people are living longer. You're getting more and more what my boss calls the silver tsunami, which is just a lot of old people walking around there on Eliquis, on aspirin, <clears throat> on Plavix, and they're going to come in with traumatic brain injuries. And what do you do? Are you going to reverse the Eliquis or the, the uh, Warfarin or the Plavix on everybody? Uh, and I'm not a fan of that. So this is, is a busy slide. Oops, sorry. Uh, it's a busy slide, but um, this is the study. If you really want to look up what the Nurse, Nurse Critical Care Society has as their recommendations, um, it's a little bit outdated. And I'll get to that in a second. But really, the, the thing I try to drill home in my residence is that I don't want you just knee jerking and reversing the anticoagulation on everybody. If they have a really small intracranial hemorrhage um, and they have a high risk of having a thromboembolic event, say they have a fresh stent, uh, or they have really bad um, AFib with a high CHAD score and a history of stroke. Uh, if they have a recent PE, something like that, if they really need their anticoagulant medication, you don't always need to reverse it. <clears throat> so use some clinical judgment. Don't always reverse it. Don't always even hold it. Talk to the patient, talk to the family and say, you know, there is a risk if we hold this medication that they're going to have some sort of thromboembolic event. There's a risk if we don't hold the medication that their intracranial injury could become severe but it's not always a knee jerk. If they, if it's somebody like our guy in our case earlier, if he was on warfarin or something, he had that big subdural, absolutely I would hold it. But if he just had a little speck of blood in his head, you know, maybe not. So it's not something that should be a knee, knee jerk reaction. And that's kind of what they say here. So for antiplatelet agents, uh, if there's neurosurgical intervention, then you consider doing a platelet transfusion. But everyone who's on aspirin that comes in with a head bleed, they don't all need a platelet, platelet transfusion. That's risky. That's gonna use up the nation's supply of platelets. Uh, for somebody who's, say, on anoxaparin or 
uh, unfractionated heparin. If they uh, say have a worsening bleed in the hospital, you don't always need to reverse it. If it's been more than 12 hours since their last dose, you can probably just go forward without reversing it. So, you know, use a little common sense. Don't just use the knee jerk reaction of reversing all anticoagulants. And then, like I said, this the original paper is a little bit uh, dated because there is this new drug that uh, specifically reverses uh, some of these factor 10A inhibitors. So <clears throat> it's uh, the data is kind of equivocal. Uh, some people advocate using it. Uh, those people um, often ignore the fact that it's a highly expensive drug, um, but it is something you can use if somebody comes in on these factor 10A inhibitors. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.